we're going to take some time here and talk about the sensors. Now, it's very important to understand we're going to have multiple sensors, inputs. The inputs are the signals to the PCM. The accelerator pedal position sensors are always going to be redundant, and so are the brake switches. We're always going to have two brake switches. Now, the accelerator pedal position sensors are inputs to the PCM for the electronic throttle control system. They signal the driver's request for torque to the controller. Why do you say they change their request torque? Because that's really the number the computer's looking at. What kind of torque does the customer want? It's then going to adjust the throttle setting to give the torque requested. It's going to be a spending a lot of time making sure it matches the torque request to the driver's request. Now, these are potentiometers. They work just like TPSs did. They measure the movements of a pedal. Now, remember the electrical definition of a potentiometer. It's a device for measuring electromotive force or potential by comparing with a known voltage. We refer to it as reference voltage. We're very familiar with that. Here's an a accelerator assembly from the vehicle. There it is mounted in place. It looks very much like a standard accelerator till you go to look at the business end underneath and you find out instead of having a cable departing, it has a wiring harness plugged into a connector which is being picking up signals from a position sensor. This position sensor works like we've had before. It's going to move around and pick different points in the resistance. It's got voltage at one end, 5 volts in our case. The signal is the pickoff, and the bottom is the return. All these little arrows mean we can move this around, and it picks different voltages off at different points. Now, some of these start off low, like here. In this illustration, we're showing the wiper is right down at the return voltage. It goes from low to high. Now, we're showing this as clockwise. Don't assume that clockwise means that. If we swapped the 5 volts at the top and the ground at the bottom, it would have to be counterclockwise. But for our purposes, it has to rotate like this to go from low to high and vice versa. If it's one that starts high and goes low, it would go the opposite direction. So the direction of rotation is determined by which pins have the 5 volts in return. The rotation is determined mechanically how we move it. It's wired up so they work the same. But we're going to go either from low to high or high to low. Some of them fall within a middle range. They start slightly above either high or low and move to somewhere else. They never get to either extremes. Now, this is really important because this is the call giving us validity. Is this a valid number? Uh, we're going to talk more about that later. All of them are going to have some type of return spring. Here's one with a cable and a return spring. The cable goes up from the accelerator through this tube back down to the spring. And the spring is going to give us the normal feel of a throttle, like it was running out of cable, out underneath the, to the throttle plate and moving the throttle plate. Some of the models even have a throttle action APP that's out underneath the hood in the engine compartment, hooked in by a cable to give the actual feel. So it depends on which car you're looking at how it's going to do. Here's one of the spring on the side. We can zoom in a little closer. You see it there on the right. You get a good view of the connector going into the uh, accelerator pedal position. Here's one with an internal spring. So, and you can see the connector there. What we are going to have that's common to all of them, after we get rid of the spring which is not big news, is they're all going to have 5-volt reference, they're all going to have signal, and they're all going to have ground. Now, pay attention. Failure mode is very important in electronic throttle control. And we have make sure you take the time to look at all the failure modes. We don't try to cover them all here. But one of the prime things it's looking at is for information about these sensors. 
Look to see if these two sensors, or three sensors as the case may be, share ground and 5 volt reference. If they do, losing 5 volts or ground can really wipe out all of the information and have no idea what the, the driver is requesting for torque. When that happens, we're going to go into a severe failure mode, and that is a clue. Learn to take those failure modes and correlate them back to here. If we lose the 5 volts or the ground, we're going to go definitely into a failure mode because we've got to have reference voltage for this sensor to work, and we've got to have ground return for the current flow through the resistor so we can take a wiper and pick off various voltages. For instance, if the wiper's at the top in this case, we're going to see 5 volts. Moving it down to the center, we'd see 2.5 volts. Now, the actual rate of change, how fast the voltage changes, is going to be determined by the resistance and the way this resistor is built. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look. Here's an early Corvette that had three exciter pedal positions. It's looking at its percentage of reference voltage on the left, pedal position on the right. So zero degrees pedal position. Pedal number one starts off a little below 20% of reference voltage, a little under a volt. Goes up to where it's almost 100%, five volts in this case. Pedal position number two starts off at about 0.9 volts and goes down to about 0.5 volts. The opposite direction. Not equal, not exact, but it's doing the opposite. Not a pure mirror image. The third one stays between both of them on the max and mens. So you have right here in one picture all three types of the voltages. Some that stay within a range, some that start low and go high, some that start high and go low. Here in this one, we've got all three. This is all important for trying to diagnose inconsistencies and bad data. Here's two more. This time we used a scan tool. We always graft accelerator pedal position when we do scan data. Because we get a picture here that wouldn't make a lot of sense if we looked at it numerically. It just wouldn't compute. You'd see numbers changing. They wouldn't be the same. What does that mean? Well, what it means is APP2 goes very linear from the minimum to the maximum. APP1 starts at a lower voltage, gets to, point, gets to 85% much quicker, and then and flat lines at 85%. This is the kind of thing you're going to get when you use a, a graph to look at those signals like we're looking at on that Corvette, where there are different ones doing different things. The amount of resistance determines how fast the voltage changes. Here's two that go from low to high. But the high is not the same. The low is not the same. One starts off very low. One starts off a little higher. The bottom one ends at 3.1 volts. The top one ends at 4.8 volts. They go low to high, but they have different rates of change. These are the kind of things to expect. Well, you say, how do we try to find out what's wrong? Well, we start off by looking at lab scopes. And we'll, here we're looking at a lab scope showing us two sensors. One ends at 2.3 volts. That's the blue trace. The red trace goes up to 4.4. In this particular vehicle, they're both normal. Now, what the PCM is going to do is it's going to take those two signals and come up with a true pedal position. And said, okay, it's zero pedal position. Setting no pedal movement, we start off at 0.5 volts. And if we read scan data, It'll read zero on this particular vehicle. This is one we made up. This is where the driver is not requesting any change in torque. Why do we keep installing change in torque? Because the driver is requesting a, a change in torque. The computer is going to turn that into a TPS 
movement. Verify it with TPS sensors and open the throttle to a prescribed distance. Now, if your steps on the gas, in this case, the throttle, goes up to 1.5 volts, computer says, okay, that's 12%. Now, what's going to happen at this point is the computer is going to sit here and say, I have 12% request. What power level is that? Is that the same kind of mass airflow I've been expecting to see? Is that the same kind of RPM? Do all the fuel control and other sensors look normal? Does vehicle speed look like what it should be with the transmission in this particular gear? Does everything look rational? We're going to talk more about rationality later. Forget the wide open throttle, 100%. There we're going to get maximum torque, and the computer is going to do it. But the question is, is it a valid request? If we go to 100%, does that look plausible? Does that look like a valid request? Tries to look at the data, see if there's anything in conflict with the data. Is it an acceptable number? Is that 4.79 within the range of acceptable input from the computer, through the computer? Is it credible? Is the is what you have for a torque request match what the computer expects to see? It's called rationality diagnostics. It's done by the redundant processors. It's power modeling. It's used to detect problems that would affect engine power. Where they don't match, you have requested 12% torque, but the computer is giving you 100% throttle opening. It's not credible. This is all based on safety. It's all based on looking at all these various inputs, with the main part of the inputs, the ones we're familiar with. Remember, we've got to know what speed it is, what gear it's in, and we've got to know what speed the engine's turning over, the crankshaft position. We've got to know what kind of load we've got, like mass airflow. Has the customer touched the brake? The one overruling, overriding thing is the brake. You can't have that happen. Battery voltage is critical. We are talking about electronic throttle control. It must have sufficient power to work reliably. When battery voltage gets too low, the processors will put the system into a fault mode and reduce the activity to an acceptable level so it knows it's safe and be double safe in everything it does. Again, make sure you go look at fault modes because don't try to cover them all the time. But it's, the computer must always be informed of the driver's intention. What's the wheel speed? How fast is it turning over? What's the vehicle? Is it in drive? What's going on? Is the, has the customer touched the brake? This is all critical safety features the computer's looking at to make logical decisions. And it's going to be using all these inputs. Make sure you solve any service codes with these before you go any further. But once we think we have a problem, with accelerator pedal position, we're going to do the standard diagnostic test. We're going to check for trouble codes. And in this particular case, we're going to use P1125, a GM-specific trouble code out of the Smart Spec CD, to show you how to look at all the information. It says the accelerator pedal position from two of the three sensors does not agree. This is off an earlier Corvette. So we get the overall thing. Let's talk about how we respond to each part of this. You're going to have some sort of structure like this, and here's the parts you should be looking for when you look at your service codes. Enabling conditions. You need a code definition. Do not take your scan tool that says TPS sensor wrong. Boom. APP error. That is not enough. You need to know what's going on. The enabling conditions. What causes this code to set? Is the sensor disagree for one second? Whatever this problem was, it lasted for one second. And when this code sets, it's going to block some conditions. Now, there's our one second. We're looking at it. Do we have one second? No, not in this particular case. Okay. We used a lab scope here. We're going to talk more about using lab scopes. And look at this again later. But let's talk about this. When we did a sweep test, 
we move through this bad spot fairly quickly. It's up around 90% throttle. If we were driving the vehicle very fast in this particular case, and we actually held that spot for a longer period of time, it would fail. It would definitely, if we stayed there a little bit longer, cause a problem between the two where the plausibility check would be there. Say, hey, they don't agree. I don't know what's, I don't know what this is. I'm not sure this is a valid number. And the computer, the PCM, could go into a failure mode. When you see a glitch like this, sweep testing, it may not cause no, any problem at all. But if you're working on an intermittent problem where it did not set a code, but occasionally caused a problem, and we have a lot of cases where motorists complain bitterly that their vehicle gets this crazy mode where it doesn't work very well, turn the key off, start it back up, it works fine, take it in for service, they can't find the problem, they say there's no codes, can't fix it. Not true. You can fix it, but you're going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to find a spot or something where something like this happens. Now, if we, were, if we held this throttle at that exact spot long enough, it would definitely cause a problem and probably set a code. But doing the sweep test, it did not set a code, didn't repeat it. That's why we use a lab scope. But let's get back to our discussion here of blocking conditions. Once this code is set, it's going to stop monitors from counting results, blocking them. They're not going to update their valid data anymore. Fuel control monitor, oxygen O2 monitor, catalyst monitor, misfire monitor, the canister purge, EGR, they're all going to say, I can't count on where the throttle is and what's going on, so I can't, I can't test these. And when you do your testing, you need to know what to look for, find a good valid test, find data that tells you what you should be looking at so that you can do a valid test to see if these things are correlating. Now here's some other sample SAE trouble codes. We pick these because these are the kind you're going to be seeing. All manufacturers are going to be using these if they have this particular signal. The P2121 is an SAE code that says the throttle pedal position sensor switch or sensor circuit D has a range of performance problem. Let's talk about what we're talking about here. This can be a problem where it is outside of a normal range. Remember we had a pretend range a while ago that went from 0.5 to 4.79? When you get a code like this, it says this particular sensor went outside of that normal range. It was down to 0.2 volts. It was up at 4.9 volts in that example. But you have to know what the range is for the code you're working on. That's why you need to go back and find something like this so you know what voltages it is. Okay? Its range was wrong. Or it didn't perform properly. Now, the other two examples on 11, uh, 21, 22, and 21, 23, the sensor circuit voltage is high or low. It's point, under 0.5. It's over 4.79 in our typical example we used earlier. So understand that you're going to take these and understand what you're going to be looking for in which sensor you're looking at. Sometimes you're going to get like 2139 says that you got two that don't correlate like we just had with the other. They don't match their readings. And then 0229 is one which says a particular sensor was intermittent. Now, what you're going to get is one of this family. These are the codes you're going to be seeing. And the way you react to them, in a minute, we just talked about that in a minute. You may have to use a lab scope in order to identify it. And remember, we showed you three different configurations. One of them, where they both go up and down the same. The other one, they go the opposite directions. And the third, they have different peak voltages. They may go up, they may go down but they have different peak voltages. Here's some examples we've been looking at, and you can look at them three different ways. We're going to talk about diagnosing with a VTO, with a 
DVOM, a DSO, and a scan tool, and the advantages of each. Now, we took this glitch and we looked at it on a scan tool. It did not show up on the scan tool. Remember, we're only going to worry about this if we're looking for an intermittent. But when you find this and you are working in a minute, it's worth its weight in gold, and you may not see it on the scan tool. When we go to checking them, we've all got to make sure we got five volts present. And look for intermittent problems where you get into major problems, we go into major failure modes. If you lose five volt reference to both of these, we have no idea what the customer wants. The system is really going to go into a safety mode and start shutting down. But we're looking for 5 volts. Scan tool, voltmeter, good way to check that. 4.9 to 5.1 is a number we have used for years and years and years. It works almost flawlessly on everything. The only exception I can think of off the top of my head is a Chrysler Jeep truck electronic controller, JTEC. It goes up to 5.25 and starts off at about 5. Other than that one computer family, everything else I've checked falls within these numbers. And the reason it does is this is the voltage needed to run the computer, and it's not going to have work very well. Here's a, a case we need to look at. We notice in this vehicle the voltage doesn't go high enough. It should go higher, only goes to 366. Now let's talk and talk about diagnostic logic. Diagnostic logic says if the max voltage doesn't go high enough, go look at the reference voltage because that's what's giving us the voltage to pull us up there. So when we don't see it go high enough, check the reference voltage. In this particular case, we had a voltage drop in the reference voltage circuit. If it doesn't go low enough, it's the ground. We say a good spec is under 50 millivolts, 0 0.050 volts. Now, that's not going to cause a problem, but good cars are all under 50 millivolts signal back to battery negative. If you're working on intermittent and it's higher than this, you may have an intermittent ground. Don't always count on seeing, oh, I've got 1.2 volts. That's going to go bad. Yes, it will. But the 1.2 volts may not be there all the time. Here's what a system looked like. We put our scope on there, our zero voltage, getting low, 0.76 volts, 760 millivolts. We can't get down to the half volt. Our zero in this case is 0.76 volts. We get the same thing if we use a voltmeter, 0.76 volts. We can't get low enough because our ground is bad. If the voltage is too high, look at the ground circuit. Then we look at it on a scan tool. Here's two things we're looking at. We go up. They go together. Signals look pretty steady, what we expect. Here's two of them looking together. They move pretty much together as we look at them on the lab scope. Here's a replacement sensor for the one we looked at earlier that had a glitch in it. But we need to look at this a little bit better and talk about it because there's some other things to talk about. Do you see any minor inconsistencies in these waveforms? Well, look, let's magnify it. They're not always the same distance apart. They're pretty steady. Get up here, they get close together. There's a little dip in there. On this side, they spread apart and get close again. Look at this, we magnify it. There is significant difference between those two. And then they get back to a normal looking range here. Then they look normal and get back down there. No two sensors are built perfectly exactly alike. This is real world. Theory says they should track perfectly, stay exactly the same distance apart. Yeah, that's good theory. Doesn't always work in reality. What we're looking for is something like this. Significant departure. Does the glitch last for one second? No. If we would go through it this quickly, it would never set a code. 
If we dwell on it, it might. Now, here is the worst TPS we've ever seen on a lab scope. We captured it. We saved it. We're sweep testing like we always do, going up and down. Now, we put a thing at the top that says, this is where the throttle is wide open. We had to do that because you can't tell from the signal. We had to tell you when it went to zero, the throttle is still opening. So we went up and then back down smoothly. This is the worst sensor we have ever, ever, ever seen. But it shows you how bad sensors can be. Here's an example. 1125. They don't agree. Here's scan data from that vehicle. We show two totally different numbers here. We, show, we are staying steady on accelerated position number two, and we drop down in accelerated position number one. They look like they're climbing together till we get to this spot, and then they suddenly disagree. So this is an example of what we found. Stays there plenty of time, no problem finding it. Look, they pretty much agree here. They look about the same. They're doing almost the same thing. But here, for a fraction of a second, they don't agree. I'm starting up my staircase on two. I haven't started moving. I mean, starting up the staircase on one. Two hasn't moved yet. Over here, I get a much bigger step than I had. One is making a much bigger step than two. And then here, I make a big drop off. Position two didn't move. This is the kind of stuff you look for in a scan tool. You see why we use grafting? You can't do it any other way. This is what our, our favorite. Uh, it is the way we do it. But the other thing we need you to remember is we have some three-wire linear Hall effect sensors. They're used in dirty environments. You'll see these in pickup trucks and places where there's construction equipment. Very dirty environments. The output accurately trackled the changes in flux density, and it doesn't suffer much from contamination, dust, and dirt. Dirt, and it depends on the magnetic pole being affected. The voltage increases or decreases, whether you're going away from or toward it. It's a north or south. Uh, if you're going toward the north pole, you decrease. Going toward the south pole, you increase. In one of the particular applications we were looking at. Every one of these things is different. It's going to be around a particular <coughs> magnet, and the magnet's going to move in and out of the Hall effect and change it. Uh, here's where you can find a product who's manufactured it, the website of the company put it on there. Um, it works just like your low current probe that you use for diagnosing other things at current flow. It's going to change measure current flow, changes in current flow. Now, brake switches, now well, you think, well, why is brake switches so Well, brake switches are so important because any time the motorist, driver, operator, whatever you want to call this person behind the wheel, puts their foot on the brake, it overrides everything else in the throttle control system. The brake is the one absolute the customer wants to slow down. Regardless of where the accelerator pedal is, the brake will take preference. They're redundant for safety reasons, and there are always two brake input switches. Here's how they work. Sometimes switch one is high when it's off. Switch two is low off. When we step on the brake, two goes high, one goes low. Other times, they both do the same thing. You have to know which one is the right direction. When you look at scan data, they do something like this, 12 volts and 0 volts, off and then to on. And then he's, here's where they're doing exactly the same thing. They both go from 0 to battery voltage. Brake switches are really, really important. Sometimes you get a yes or no if they're open, and they go together. And you've all seen that on your scan tool. In the self-diagnostics, the sensors with its brake or et cetera, pedal position inputs are compared to each other. Is the range right? 
are they rationality doing the same thing? If there's any reason the range is in disagreement or the rationality is in disagreement, we're going to go into fault mode. It must be acceptable. Does it correlate with the other sensors? Unreliable sensors are excluded from the system control. And if both of these sensors are unreliable, we can no longer control throttle. We have to go to a safety mode. They're all chose check to see for a stuck state in which one of the switches, one will switch states and the one doesn't. They're trying to find any combinations. They've got to make sure both states change and they both agree. And then what you should be doing is looking for diagnostic trouble codes. Good example, P504, brake switch, A and B correlation. They're not both doing what they're supposed to be doing. Go pay attention to what they're doing. Now, remember, the brake switches are critically important. It is the safety net for electronic throttle control. Electronic throttle control depends on the brake switch to always take the throttle to start decelerating any time the motorist hits the brake. Do not try to drive one of these vehicles with one foot lightly on the brake opening that switch and one foot lightly on the gas because the brake will take preference. Make sure you go and look at the fault codes, fault modes, because they'll tell you where to go. The biggest complaint people have about electronic throttle is strange operation of vehicle, and all of this gets explained when you really thoroughly go through all this operation and the inputs and the outputs for the TPS and the motor control. 